Hello, welcome to the video for what is material, the main material node, part four. We're going to go ahead and we will cover world position offset, world displacement, tessellation multiplier, and subsurface color today. We're going to go ahead and start with the world position offset. World position offset basically takes the position of the vertices and the parts of the mesh itself, whatever this material is applied to, and it offsets them in whichever direction you tell it to. So for my example here, I'm going to go ahead and hook up this little function I created and hook up a little emissive color. Let's go ahead and apply this. And what this is going to do is it's going to use the time multiplier. And it's going to use a sine wave. And let's make this make this a little different color to make it easier to see. Let's try that. Okay. Oops, and I also have something else still selected. Let's shut off subsurface and go back to default lit for now. So what this does is I'm using a sine wave and a time node, which we will learn about later. And I'm basically over time offsetting the world position for this item. And it's giving it kind of like a jiggly jello motion. Now, if we look at it in wireframe, you'll notice nothing's happening. The item itself does not change. It's physical characteristics where the vertices and edges are will not move. What this does is it simply offsets them in the rendering portion so that way it looks like things have changed. So if you actually look at it, we kind of have a little bit of a flapping going on with the top ones and the sides and the bottoms are doing the same thing, but it gives us you know, a little jiggling motion and we're not having to actually do any animation. So you can imagine if, what if this was a water surface and we gave it a little bit of buoyancy and it actually looks like, you know, water. We put it down on its side like this, give it a little bit of a water texture, give it a water normal, and now we have something that looks like slightly moving water without actually doing any animation. So, World Position Offset is basically a way of easily adding something to your material or your mesh without actually changing the physical characteristics of it. And you do that by plugging whatever you want into the World Position Offset. What I'm doing is basically taking the UV layout, multiplying it by time and the sine function, and then changing the World Position Offset. It doesn't have to be motion. It could simply be you want a brick wall and you simply want some of the characteristics of the brick wall to be pushed out farther so you could use another function to do that so actually let's go ahead and then i'll move us over to the next one let's move this function over let me go ahead and put this into my world position offset let me go and change this back to white from a base color we're going to go ahead and put a normal in here and we're going to go ahead and apply what we're doing here is we are putting a normal brick texture in our normal slot. We are making it white. And then we are taking another brick texture of an actual color for our base color. And based on the settings inside of it and the normals and the world space and things like that, we are offsetting our cube. So if we did not have this in here, that probably would have been the smarter thing to show first. Let me go ahead and apply that. And let me take our skylight. Let me get rid of our spotlight. Let me get our, oops, let's try that again. Okay, let's, there we go. Let's go ahead and get our directional light and let's, Let's move it like that. Let's see if we can get a little bit of a, a different scene here. Something, okay, a little bit better color would be nice. Let's try this again, shall we? Where is our, there we go. Let's go ahead and rotate this. 
Um, I'll try something like that. Okay, that gives us a little bit better. Okay, so let's make this wider. Screw it. There we go. So we have our cube here. Now, if you notice, we have a flat texture here, and we have a normal map plugged it plugged in. So it looks like we have a little bit of depth. But let's say it's not deep enough for us, or we wanted something moved. We can use the world position offset. And let's actually move this down to let's say 0.5. Let's move to let's move to just two. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the normals of this texture, which is the outside facing, and we're gonna offset it by two. So if you look at it, once it's actually done compiling, it's going to take this object and it's going to offset those normals by two in each of the directions, each of the sides by two. So if you actually look, you'll notice they are moved by two. And if we look at our wireframe of our cube, you'll notice the wireframe is still the same. But if we look at the lit mode, you'll notice we actually have a gap now because we've moved by two in every direction from the middle. That is what our world position offset allows us to do. It allows us to move things in the world position. Now the problem there is obviously we have a gap and we didn't quite get our achieved result. We just wanted to give it a little more depth but not break it. So that is what tessellation is for. This is our next section here. We have world displacement and tessellation multiplier. These are both parts of tessellation. You need to scroll down to the tessellation property and turn on tessellation. Note tessellation does require direct 3D11. We have two options, flat tessellation and PN triangles. I'm gonna go ahead and go with PN triangles. It gives us a little better result. And here's something you're going to notice. We had our cube and when we were in wireframe, you saw what our cube looked like. It was the cube and it had, you know, a few lines. It's a little bit difficult to see here, but we had basically vertexes and triangles and quads and we had a, a very small amount of them covering our actual cube itself. Now using tessellation what it's going to do is it's going to create drop geometry for us to work with. So now that it's done you'll notice we now have a cube with a much much more detailed surface. You see that we have triangles all over this surface. That's because we're using tessellation. Now if we go back into here, we still have everything set up, but if we move it from the world position offset to the world displacement, and we go ahead and compile that, what's going to happen is it's going to use all of our extra tessellation, all of our extra surface area, the triangles we created, and it's going to fill in those gaps along the edges like we had an issue with before on the world position offset. So if we were to look at it now in lit mode, you'll notice we no longer have those gaps and you'll actually notice we don't have flat surfaces anymore. We have slightly offset surfaces with a little more detail. So you'll notice on our little wireframe mode here, we have a little bit of extra geometry filling in. We have some curved edges. We've basically pushed out the edges, but we filled it in with extra geometry using tessellation. So we filled in our gaps. That is what the world displacement does. World displacement physically creates new geometry, displaces it based on how you told it to, which is we told it along our vertex normal, and then you basically create new geometry. And looking at our actual wireframe, as you can see, we actually have new geometry. It's a little difficult to see, but we actually do have new geometry filling in our edges. We have surface details. We no longer have a flat square, but we have new filled in created geometry. Now our tessellation multiplier is basically how much tessellation are we going to use when we use world displacement. Now if you notice this, you'll see how full it is. It's, it's pretty full. We have a pretty filled out square of tessellation. I'm going to go ahead and hook up tessellation multiplier to 0.1 and apply. And this is going to apply a 0.1 multiplier to our tessellation. Remember, by default, we have a 1 for our multiplier. So when this is done, it's going to use basically a tenth of the tessellation, which obviously would help out on performance and things like that when we have a large scene. 
So if we go ahead and open it up, you'll notice our cube now is much less tessellated. There's less tessellation inside of our cube that we actually work with. And if you go ahead and we check it out in lit mode, you'll notice it still looks roughly the same. It's not quite as pulled out because we have less tessellation to work with. But it still gives us the goal we want. And that's what the tessellation multiplier lets us do. So when we go ahead and we look at it in wireframe mode, you'll notice as we zoom in and out, tessellation is going to increase or decrease based on how much of the screen is filled up by this object. So it's a great way to, we're zoomed out all the way. It's hard to see and understand that, but basically we have very little tessellation. And as we get closer and closer, it's going to fill in and it's going to give us more and more tessellation until we get all the way close up to the item. So tessellation multiplier, you can go ahead and play with that. It's a way to basically improve performance, lower it to the lowest amount where you get acceptable results because higher than that, you're just basically wasting performance. So on to our last one, subsurface color. I'm going to go ahead and disconnect these and move it down to an example that I've created down here. So our surface color requires us to change our shading model to subsurface. It's going to go ahead and unlock the subsurface color. Now if you notice, we still have world position displacement and tessellation multiplier because we still have tessellation turned on. Most of these things are additive. You can go ahead and use one and the other. You can have subsurface turned on because it's a shading model. And then you could have a different blend mode turned on. Like I have mass turned on, I could change this. And you could have the material domain changed. So let's go ahead and shut off our tessellation. Since we're not going to use it for now, we're going to focus on subsurface color. Subsurface color is intended to mimic thin, transparent materials. If you've ever looked at your skin and you notice how it, sometimes it'll appear red or you can see the veins underneath it, or the most used example is an ear. If you take and shine a flashlight on the back side of an ear, you can actually see through the ear and it's not going to be the same color as the surface. It's going to have a different color underneath, usually a reddish tint indicating the blood vessels and such. This is an attempt to mimic that using subsurface. So let me go ahead and hook up my base color. I'm going to go ahead and make this a slightly rough item without metallic. And then what I'm going to do is not apply my subsurface color. By default, if you do not apply a subsurface color, it's going to be white. And if you look, the edges are not blue. These edges are going to give me a slightly white where the light is shining through it. This is mimicking a slightly thin surface. The light is hitting it, and then you're seeing what's below it, which by default is white. If we go ahead and we pull up our item and look at it, you can see it reacting in real time. So we have our light source, which is here, and the direction it is going is basically from the top down right here. When the light is hitting this and the light's passing through the edges, we can go ahead and we can see we get a better angle if possible. Sorry about this. We can see the white on the edges, which is our thin surface, and that's our subsurface color. Now, if you notice where the light isn't hitting, we're not getting that effect because the light is not shining through on this side. The light is shining through on this side. Now, if we hook up a subsurface color, then we go ahead and apply that. We're now going to get that color reflect refracted, reflected back through on the sides where the light is shining and hitting directly. So you notice here on our backside, we have our bluish color with a slight hint of red because we have a light directly on it. And on the sides where the light is shining through, which is over here, for example, this thin surface, we can see the red. And then on these edges, we can see a slight red color where our subsurface hits. 
It's basically mimicking, like I said, skin, and it's a great way to get a little bit of extra detail if you need something below something else. It is primarily used for skin. That's going to be your primary use for this. Other than that, you can use it to give a nice, you know, shimmering effect, a nice odd effect when light hits and goes through at certain angles. But it's really simple to use. You just simply plug in your subsurface color and your other settings. Try to give it a little bit of a roughness. It makes it look a little bit better. And then, of course, metallic or not based on what you want, but it's usually used for organic colors. So that is going to be our subsurface color input. That's going to wrap up part four of our video. We're going to cover part five next. And we'll cover clear coat, clear coat roughness, ambient occlusion, and refraction. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them below.